Good afternoon, Ellen Tamaki. Welcome on VH Berries. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. I am extremely grateful. How is Brooklyn and yourself doing today? Brooklyn is cold. It happened really fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm doing great. I've had a, a really quiet but lovely day. Yeah. A very quiet and lovely day, Ellen Tamaki. And Eight years after, I am actively searching for Sally May, and I still don't know where she is. Let's ask Frankie. Maybe that she knows. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, my gosh. I can't believe you know about that. That's a project I did in college. Um, <laughs> no one. I don't think we found out where she. I don't think we found out where she was. Maybe she was a, a stuffed animal? I don't remember what happened in that movie. <laughs> Absolutely. Into the credits of uh, searching for uh, Sally May, I uh, realized that there are no comedian playing that part. It is only a voiceover. Yeah, I think I'm remembering now that she was like a stuffed monkey. <laughs> <laughs> But I don't, I don't remember really. I shot maybe one day. It was a student film, and I shot maybe one day on it. And all I remember is <laughs> it was really cold, <laughs> and I was in a basement. Maybe sounds like a student film. I don't know. <laughs> it was. Uh, in a basement, and it was more importantly, as I just mentioned, already eight years ago. And by listening to your voice, Ellen Tamaki, I feel that this is reminding you a lot of very powerful uh, souvenirs and memories. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Um, well, I, I don't particularly remember much about that project. Um, I'm not gonna lie to you. Uh, it was kind of something that, like, a bunch of my friends were asked to do by people that we didn't really know <laughs> that well. Um, we, I, I can talk about some of my friends that worked on it. I was in a, I was in a, a theater program at Boston University, um, and we had a really tight knit class. And a lot of those people I'm still very close friends with today. We live in Brooklyn together or, um, or in New York together or, um, or, you know, they live far away and we still keep in touch. But um, a lot of the people, a lot of the actors that worked on that project um, are amazing, talented, beautiful people. <laughs> and that's, I think maybe that's what you're picking up on is that I'm thinking of them and that I love them. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you made very strong connection at that time. And to remind you uh, of some of the storyline and the plot of that, that story is, it is uh, telling um, the adventure of four who mates who accidentally throw a raging party. And the next day, guess what's happened? They must face, obviously, um, facing the consequences uh, and try to put their lives together. That checks out. I don't know <laughs> if I ever saw it. <laughs> it just kind of was one of those projects that's, you know, like thrown together. We were in a really collaborative space. Like all of us were just making things and creating things. And um, I think that one may have just, I, I don't even know if I saw the finished product. I don't know if they finished it. I <laughs> I don't know about that Nobody, one. nobody knows uh, Ellen Tamaki about where is that project as well as uh, Sally May. <laughs> But at the contrary side, There's, one, it's really uh, meta. There's a lot of mysteries involved, right? There is a lot of <laughs> mystery involved, and uh, on the complete. Opposite side, uh, one uh, play that you did that was seen by a lot of people um, includes your character playing a tennis woman called Billy 
Jane King. And I'm sure that this time everything is in your mind. <laughs> um, I would say so. Yeah, that was one of the most <laughs> yeah, important, powerful, influential acting experiences I've had in my life. Um, I was lucky enough to work with One Year Lease Theatre Company and uh, in, their, in their brilliant production of Balls, um, which was a play about the Battle of the Sexes, which is a famous tennis match between the iconic Billie Jean King and Bobby Riggs. And, um, but it was also a play about gender roles and sports and competition, athleticism and community and um, who you're allowed to love. It was beautiful. It was so powerful. We workshopped it and uh, premiered it down in Houston, Texas. And then it came to New York and uh, it ran off Broadway uh, at 59 East 59th for a while. It was it was phenomenal. And I played Billie Jean King, which I nothing can compare. She came to the show. She came and saw it. So it was beautiful. Absolutely. And Ellen Tamaki, I would love to focus on that uh, theater play because this is what we can call uh, something very experimental, but above everything, something very physical because it is directly connected to the sport of uh, Billie Jean King, which is tennis. Right. So I, uh, in school, studied a lot of physical theater and was really excited to be able to implement my training in um, in such a collaborative way. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, I mean, the way that we were able to work and create this piece of theater together was unlike anything I had really been able to experience. Um, we played the entire tennis match on stage with no balls which is funny because the play is called Balls, right? But there were no <laughs> physical tennis balls on the stage in, in play. There were tennis balls on stage happening in other, in other capacities, but um, the way that the, that the game was stylized was mostly my scene partner who played Bobby Riggs, the brilliant Donald Corrin and I, had memorized every single point, every move, every step, every bounce of the actual match and recreated it on the stage. And a Foley sound artist would click their Foley pad and bounce, make the sounds of the bounces, if this is making sense. So as I would swing my racket, you would hear the sound of a tennis ball being hit, but there would be no ball on stage. And we worked tirelessly to kind of perfect this timing and, and trick audiences into thinking we were playing a tennis match in front of them. And it worked and it was really successful. And, um, and I loved it. It was so physical and so fun and, and very experimental. <laughs> The trick uh, worked uh, perfectly, Ellen Tamaki, and um, this play was taking place uh, at the Stages uh, Repertory Theatre in New York City. And um, I assume that you also had dialogues over everything. Yes, yeah, so um, it, it went on at Stages, which was in Houston, and then 59 East 59th, which was in, in New York. And yes, uh, so simultaneously to playing the game, there would be um, all of the people in, in our lives would be on the sideline of the match, you know, coming in and interacting with us, or there were super fans that were putting pressure on the game, or there would be moments where the... <laughs> the entire tennis, the net would move and just one character would be on stage speaking out to the audience. I mean, anything was possible in this world and you were really living <laughs> inside of their, of these characters' heads and how, how much, especially how much Billy really needed to prove to the world um, by winning this match. 
Would you say, Ellen Tamaki, that you're getting, uh, for example, uh, with balls, a step closer uh, to William Shakespeare because <laughs> uh, he's described as a playwright, a poet, and an actor. And from what I'm seeing, the only missing part is maybe the poetry one. Maybe, uh, and maybe that I don't know everything about it. Maybe that you are already a poet. <clears throat> I myself am not. Uh, I really <laughs> wish I could write. I think it's such a generative, creative thing to create something that never existed before. Um, but I am someone that says words that other people have already written. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I definitely utilized a lot of um, tactics that maybe uh, Shakespeare's writing demands in that production um there were moments that uh yeah a lot of the a lot of the work that you use when you speak Shakespeare's text I was also using in that production and um oh man yeah it was there there's always crossover right you're going to use every little piece of your toolbox in every single opportunity that you get but I think it's just so much more apparent when you get to use your whole body in, in the way that you do in theater. You know, you're acting from the top of your head to the tips of your toes. Um, the audience can see the whole, your whole body and, um, and that feels pretty theatrical or Shakespearean to me, yeah. I really like that uh, images from the top of your head to the tip of your toes. And there are actually eight letters in the name Sally May exactly like the eighth letter of the word manifest, a manifest um, is at the same time an adverb, a verb and a noun. What is your personal meaning of a manifest? You know, what first came to mind honestly was um <laughs> was the list you know a manifest on an airplane is the list of passengers and so i think of the kind of steps that you take to get somewhere could be a list <laughs> or i'm someone that i thrive <laughs> with lists i write lists of everything in my life um things I want to do, things I want to accomplish, things I have to do, my to-do list, my grocery list. Um, I exist with lists around me and, and they are so motivating and so powerful. And then it turns into many things on my lists I want to manifest as a verb. Um, I want to call into existence. I want to be in conversation with and and kind of touch into this magical otherworldly space where you can I don't know ask for something and hopefully receive it or will it into being almost not even not even ask and receive but create it yourself and and do the work with all your lists <laughs> If I understood correctly, Ellen Tamaki, a manifest is a list and something inside a list that is not on, for example, the list of a church is security cameras. Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> the One item that is not on, for example, a checklist of a church is security camera. I am referring to one of your very first uh, dialogue and sentences in the television series. Oh my gosh. Back in season two? I Absolutely. Say, There's no security camera at the church. Wow. You oh are my safe. gosh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. What a deep dive. That's season two, Drea. She's a different woman than she is in season four. I'll tell you that. You just mentioned the evolution between uh, the season of Manifest uh, concerning uh, Drea uh, Mikami, which is your character. How would you describe uh, that specific evolution that you just mentioned? I think that Drea becomes more herself throughout the three seasons that we get to see her. She 
cracks wide open. And I think that's enabled by, you know, the people she spends her time with mostly, I'd say Michaela and, and Jared um, love her for who she is and, and she's allowed to be her true self. I think when we first meet Drea, she's hiding a lot. She's hiding um, her past. She's hiding about her family. She's hiding about the money that she comes from. She's hiding why she wants to be a detective so badly um, because so much of her life has been goal oriented, work, work, work. And I think in finding the love that she finds with her best friend and with her fam, with this new family, she's able to reprioritize a lot of things. Um, it's not just about It's not just about becoming a cop or becoming a detective. It's about why she wanted to, which was always this pursuit of justice and the triumph of right over wrong. And and I think all of that is able to be revealed because she has the support around her finally and the love for who she truly is. And so we see a woman who, who knows who she is and is loved for who she is by the time we hit season four. Absolutely, Ellen Tamaki, and in definitive, your character uh, called Drea Mikami is getting closer to uh, her uh, intimate uh, manifest. And I feel uh, that uh, your journey has been a manifest because you've been traveling um, abroad, all around the world, to learn and accomplish yourself. And I would love to retrace that journey um yeah so i'd say i i've i a lot of the traveling that i've done um i traveled while i was in school i went abroad to london i studied at lambda for a semester um and i studied shakespeare there and um and it was a yet another very cold experience. <laughs> I saw some of the best <laughs> theater I've ever seen in the world. Um, and then after that, I was able to tr uh, do a Euro trip. <laughs> um, and then after that, I was able to travel all over Europe. It was, my, it was one of my first times ever being there. I had been once before with my brother, but um, I, was, I wanted to spend some significant time. So I went to Paris, where you're from. Um, I went uh, all over. I was in Germany. I was in uh, Brussels. I was in Spain. I was in, you know, the UK and uh, Czech Republic and uh, all over. And it was, I, I think there's a lot of learning that I was able to do um, in a classroom setting. And there's so much learning I've been able to do living my life internationally as well. And um, I've had a limited experience doing that, but uh, but I think it's so valuable and um, I can't wait to do more. You cannot wait to do more. And Ellen Tamaki, are you telling me that uh, extraordinary theater in the middle of the snow or a very cold weather is losing all of his appeal? <laughs> <laughs> that would be experimental. <laughs> that would be, um, I don't know if I could do that. I, I mean, no, I could. I'm tough. I'm I'm whiny about the cold, but I'm I if it was if it was for the right reasons, I could do some deep snow winter theater for sure. I would just need to be on a beach for the next six months after that. <laughs> Absolutely, to take some very well-deserved uh, vacation. And you just uh, mentioned Ellen Tamaki, two different settings. We have on one hand the classroom setting that is very formal and all around the theory. But on the other side, uh, there is uh, the living your life setting. Um, what would you say uh, is the most important one and your biggest lesson from both? Well, I'd say now that I'm out, uh, now that I'm out of school, um, I, well, that's an interesting question. Okay. So what I've learned from both 
I think what my, my, <laughs> sorry, that's, that's a big question. Like what my biggest lesson from living life is. <laughs> oh God. Um, I think my biggest lesson from, from school and not even just from theater school, although it was, it was highlighted mostly in theater school, but, but I learned it, you know, from the moment I started school, I think the biggest thing I learned was, um, was about community and was about collaboration and about finding the, the people that you work well with. And um, we're stronger together than we are apart. And to continue, you know, working and and creating with people who have different opinions or thoughts or uh, backgrounds than you. Um, and then I think that has carried over into, so, so often for me, I feel like set or or rehearsal rooms can be school as well even though they're not graded in the same way or um they don't look like a classroom they feel to me like you're going back to school in a certain way and you can learn so many different things and the thing that comes up over and over again for me is learning how to be with other people um and and learning how to give and take and listen and and speak and and exist and collaborate with others, especially other artists, um, just so we can create the best thing possible. So I would say that's what came out of school and work for me. And then, oh man, my favorite thing that I've learned about life is really like indulgence, like try everything you can, try every food, try every, like for instance, I'm going on a big trip next year for the, and I'm really nervous about it. And I, and I, and I, I'm like, my finger is like hovering over the, by the, by the flight button because I, I feel scared to, to try this new thing. But I think the biggest thing I've learned through going through life is you have to experience it. You know, you're not going to make new lessons by sitting on your couch. You're going to, you're going to learn new things by devouring what's in front of you and, um, I hope to be brave enough to do that in my life. Brave enough to do that in life, Ellen Tamaki. <laughs> and um, furthermore, there are those two very powerful words that you mentioned, which are uh, community and collaboration. Um, especially <laughs> when it comes to make some homework and work about William Shakespeare <laughs> and also the Greeks. You need to be strong together to pass that. Of course, yeah. I mean, to, those two were, were the major parts of my, of my schooling and of my education. Um, and you need help, you know. And also, like, the, the, that's what so much of those, so many of those... Um, of the themes in both of those in, in Greek theater in in Shakespearean theater, the themes are, you know, alone, we are weak. We are, we go crazy, but together we are, we are strong. And Ellen Tamaki, uh, to come back to what uh, you are focusing right now and what you just uh, finished, uh, I am talking about the television series uh, Manifest. It is coming to an end with a final season. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? About the final season or about the show? About both, because they are... <laughs> connected it is the last season uh, the season in which your character is uh, as you just said before herself i wish i could tell you more about the final chunk um but my lips have to be sealed about that there are so many spoilers that could arise that i need to be so care i can't be the one You know, I can't be the one that spoils the second <laughs> chunk, but I will tell you where we are. <laughs> Abs absolutely. <laughs> I mean, we've just seen in the first half of the final season, um, Drea's working for um, a registry for the, the passengers of Flight 828. And so these passengers are being treated like second-class citizens. They have to 
check in with this registry that's keeping tabs on them, that's doing experimental tests on them. Um, and that's, they're, they're unable to work. They're, they're unable to be free people. And um, Drea is kind of the guy on the inside leading a double life here, working as an undercover detective for the registry, but obviously with the passenger's best interests in mind. And she is doing what she can for her dear friends and the family of them. Um, but oftentimes her hands are tied because in order to keep her job, she has to keep her head above water at work. So she is a really complicated first half of this season. She's um, navigating an extremely stressful work-life balance. Um, and thankfully something that's not that's not bringing any more drama is her dating life. Um, she is seeing uh, another character who we all know as Jared. Uh, they have been dear friends for the last four years and they've started seeing each other, no strings attached, so that that's not adding any drama to her life. And so I really <laughs> understand that she just kind of needs somewhere where she can be herself and relax because she's unable to do that at work. Absolutely, in definitive, there are always a, a, a bit of magic in every of those projects. For example, um, in Manifest, but also on your previous uh, television series, which is called Charmed. Yeah, my friends and I joke a lot that I really have this niche when it comes to television, where I'm I'm a detective on a show about magic or some sort of magical <laughs> element, but I'm not in on it. I'm always just like, hmm, what do you think's going on in this town? <laughs> <laughs> and everyone else is like, it's magic. And I'm like, are you, are you sure? You think so? <laughs> um, but it's it's incredible. I mean, I think that kind of television just opens up so many doorways for us to be able to talk about a range of topics under the guise of, of magic or other sorts of... We, we're just able to open up so many themes with when it comes to something kind of otherworldly and and I also I believe in magic and I believe in all sorts of things like that I grew up reading fantasy I grew up interested in those worlds and so um, I think it's it's only right that I get to work with that kind of these power these superpowers Hélène Tamaki about those superpowers I am confident about the future because I believe that this is only the beginning of a trilogy of magical <laughs> television series. We have Charmed, Manifest, and who knows, another one. More magic, please, please. <laughs> In conclusion, uh, Ellen Tamaki, are you focusing your time on other projects? Uh, I would love to know more about um, what are your uh, main interests at the moment? For the time being, I have nothing kind of on my docket. Um, I've got things stewing, of course. <laughs> um, but I, 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 I just had an audition earlier today. I'm feeling really interested in how I can reintegrate and recommit um, to that practice. Um, I, I also am having a glorious time with back in my life um I love to cook and I've been able to cook every night and um <laughs> I really I got a new video game and I really love it so much and so I've been playing Zelda Breath of the Wild a lot <laughs> so I saw they're doing a Zelda uh adaptation so maybe they can they can call me for that and I can play somebody in there um <laughs> because <laughs> that's pretty magic that's really magical um but otherwise i'm 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 really excited i'm connecting back with my family um we're about to go away for the holidays and um i'm gonna go see my brother after this i i just i'm i'm really similar to drea i'm kind of finding myself and reconnecting with with who i am again 
finding yourself and reconnecting uh, with who you are. Thank you, Elena Tamaki. Oh, thank you so much. It's a joy to talk to you.